Hey folks, uh, with Legion coming up, I wanted to get a quick video guide out here for people looking for a league starter. Uh, this is going to be for the Hierophant. This was the Holy Flame Totem build that I played back in 3.6. Um, that even as somebody who really likes totems and is used to having a pretty easy league start with Arc Totems or, or uh, Freezing Pulse Totems, I thought Holy Flame Totem was one of the easiest and smoothest league starts I've ever had. So I wanted to get this video up for the people that are undecided, uh, not sure what to do for league start uh, for 3.7. Obviously there's a lot of melee updates, there's a huge melee rebalance, a lot of tasty looking melee skills. Problem is if you're in a trade league, uh, everybody's thinking the same thing, right? So. All that melee stuff is going to be expensive in the trade league. So one way to get a bunch of currency early on is to play a build that you know is stable and is going to get you into, into high tier maps quickly and easily without a lot of currency investment. Earn yourself some currency and then buy some of these items so you can go back and play some other build that you want. Me personally, I actually wound up playing this build uh, all the way up to level 99 in Synthesis. And I would have actually hit 100 pretty easily. I just kind of got bored at the league. And I think it, I hit 99, you know, three, three and a half weeks in maybe. Um, but yeah, this this build can basically crush all the content in the game, in my experience. Um, I really had no issues. I had actually never bothered to fight Uber Elder before Synthesis. And um, so the first time I fought him was on this build and he just absolutely got wrecked. Um, he killed me twice. <laughs> I had never seen that fight myself. So, uh, let's switch over to Path of Building really quick. Uh, I will include links to Path of Building, uh, and this build for Path of Building in the description of the video. So, if you've never used this program before, grab it from the download link that I have in the description, and then you're going to want to copy the Path of Building paste bin link, uh, that I've also, I'm going to have in the description. And so you'll just open up Path of Building, uh, click a new file, and then come up here to this Import Export, and click Import from Pastebin right here. And you're going to copy that Pastebin link into there. It'll say Code is Valid, and you'll click Import right here. And that's going to load my whole build for you. Obviously, some people watching this know exactly what I'm talking about, but not everybody does. So this is the layout that I would use for the, uh, for the Hierophant. And down here, you'll see that I've got these trees broken up into different sort of uh, breakpoints. And they're broken up by labyrinth because that seems like the easiest sort of uh, separating point for leveling. So normal labyrinth, this is basically from league start all the way up to um, like level 33 or so. You'll hit this in Act 3. Now I usually come out here in the uh, man and health regen line. Uh, there's no problem coming out in the damage line here for a little bit more damage, especially early game. It's not bad. Um, I found though that the mana regen in particular uh, is nice coming out this way, even early. And now that they've reduced the amount of mana we have access to um, behind mine over matter, there's no, they're gone now. The mana regen is actually even more useful than it was before. So I'm definitely going to come out this way again. Um, but there's really not much going on here. You're pretty much league starting uh, level one. You're going to come straight out through here, pick up a few notables on the way. Um, but you're pretty much beelining for this node ancestral bond. And what this is going to do is make it so you don't get to deal damage, but you're going to get plus one totems. So you can summon two totems at a time. Um, from there, you're going to pick up some more damage nodes like here. Divine Fury. Uh, you're going to pick up an early jewel socket, and this is pretty much going to be the only jewel socket you get early on um, for this jewel, Reign of Splinters. And you're not going to want to pick up this jewel uh, slot until you can trade for one of these. Um, and what this is going to do is it's going to give you two additional gouts of flame on each of your flame totems, um, which is a humongous increase in terms of clear speed. It does reduce your totem damage a little bit, but 
is the trade-off is totally worth it. And I actually didn't even remove this jewel when I fought Uber Elder. The amount of additional screen coverage you get is super nice from this jewel. Um, but otherwise, you don't really take uh, jewel slots until much later in the game. Uh, so this is about where you'll be. And your first when you when you do finally complete the first labyrinth, you pick up Pursuit of Faith here. This just gives you um, a third totem. Uh, it doubles your totem duration, so you don't have to resummon them that often. But in general, that's not really a big deal for us. Um, and then it gives you more damage for killing uh, enemies and having a totem out, period. So you'll get 6% more damage for every enemy you can kill within a 4 second window. Um, it's just basically, you know, more damage while you're clearing. Uh, so then you're going to level... This is, like I said, this will put you at about level 33 when you follow this path. And then Crew Labyrinth is from like 33 to about 55. And you're going to be coming down here to pick up Mind Over Matter. Now you're going to pick up Mind Over Matter somewhere between the Innocence and the Kitaba fight in Act 5. And I would recommend you don't pick this up until you've also picked up this Insightfulness cluster right here. Because you're going to want some extra mana uh, in your pool before you take this. Because what this is going to do is it's going to make you uh, split damage between your health and your mana. So your mana pool is going to act like a secondary life bar, basically. Uh, so you're going to want um, some extra mana here. And then you pick up some extra mana and uh, regeneration down here. Come over here, more mana, more life. And you're working your way over here. Again, more mana, more life, more mana. Mana is going to become a, a theme here. <laughs> you know, Mind Over Matter is a really important defensive layer, but it does require a significant investment into mana. So a lot of mana gets picked up, especially early game, when you're not going to have gear that has a ton of mana on it. You want to boost as much as possible. Uh, your second point should definitely be Ritual of Awakening, which is uh, the second totem line. This one gives you a humongous totem placement speed boost, which is a big deal when it comes to clear speed, and it's actually one of the primary reasons that I play this build as a Hierophant and not as a Scion. Um, not only does he place totems so much faster, because he gets 20% totem placement here, 20% totem placement here, and then 50 here. So he gets 90 just for being a Hierophant. And this uh, it makes a pretty big difference in terms of how quickly you can drop totems. But on top of that, it says here you get uh, you summon an additional totem every time you put a totem down. So unlike a Scion, who by default would place totems one at a time, you drop two. And you get this without having to equip the multiple totem support gem, which lowers the damage of all of your totems collectively. In fact, you actually get 3% more damage per totem from this node instead of losing damage from multiple support multiple totem support and then on top of that you get some free uh, life and mana regeneration for every totem you have out um, for those wondering this increased damage per totem does not make multiple totem support worth using for us um, it's still a damage loss when you are at four totems and you'll get your fourth totem um, from a shield which I'll go over you know when we're at the end here and then for Merciless, which will take you all the way up to right about the end of the story, you'll be around like 65 to 70, depending on how many side quests you did during the story mode. Uh, and the theme's pretty similar here. You're coming out this way to pick up. Uh, and this is pretty much the only damage you're going to get until you get over here. Um, this nimbleness line is actually deceptively good. It's cast speed, movement speed. Which is an abstract thing, but it's definitely a clear speed increase. Just a nice quality of life. Uh, and then Critical Multiplier. Which, in the late game, is probably the most powerful stat we have at increasing damage. Uh, we pick up some more life in ES here. This is unfortunately kind of a crappy cluster. But uh, the efficiency of coming down this way still makes this a decent idea compared to coming up here. And actually, I'll go over that really quick. Um, because a lot of people will take this upper path over here and they'll pick up Written in Blood and Doomcast over here. And, uh, 
and they'll come down and, and connect to cold hearted instead of coming down this way. Which, as I go over in the notes section here, we've got some some other tips and stuff in the pace bin. That's a totally valid way to go. I just don't find it as efficient as it looks at first glance. And the reason for that is because it's deceptively far. It looks, it's only two points from here, right? And there's two points to get to here. So it almost looks like it would be the same. Um, and if you come out here, you actually also path by Throat Seeker and Snowforge, which are both uh, quite good clusters themselves. The problem is twofold. Well, really, it's threefold. The first is that this path from here to here is uh, five nodes. One, two, three, four, five, right? But for us to get from here to here, or really from here to here, is one, two, three, four, to get to the same sort of road here. So we've lost the skill point already, because it took us an extra point to get here. The second problem is that this line here, we would take either way. Because we need this mana. Right? We can't leave this behind even if we want to go this way. We're, we're already tight on mana. So if we came up this way, we'd still come down here. Which means we're down another skill point. Because we got to come over here anyway. And then, there's to get to Doomcast, there is another connection up here. That you get, once you finish Written in Blood... A third skill point is required to sync up here. So we've lost three skill points coming up here. And three skill points is an enormous amount of efficiency to lose. It dilutes the value of all this stuff up here, no matter how much uh, it looks on a per point basis by itself. Uh, great. Those three points wind up being really damaging to the efficiency of these nodes. They're also a little bit narrow. This is really just life in ES, and this is just damage. Whereas down here, we get almost the same amount of damage, but we also get things like resistances, evasion rating, more movement speed, more dexterity, and more projectile speed, which are all abstract a little bit compared to just raw damage. But they wind up, in my opinion, contributing a little bit more to clear speed and, and sort of quality of life, um, particularly the movement speed and the projectile speed down here. Uh, but this is about where you should be when you finish the story and then for your third point you wind up taking this conviction of power node this is a really good node because it gives you both free power and endurance charges you'll notice we don't really invest in either of these in terms of the skill tree neither one of them is really worth wasting skill points on like getting a fourth uh power charge you can see here this is a really small amount of damage it's only worth like 1% effective crit. It's really just not worth the skill points to invest in endurance or power charges. But getting them for free is a pretty good deal. This is uh, not something... Oh, we can switch this over to Holy Flame Totem. So in the gear that I have in this path of uh, building, we're doing about 200,000. You know, we're getting a nice little bump in damage from having the power charges. We'd actually have to turn these off in the config. So it's 173 uh, to 197. Um, but this also gives you some damage pen. The endurance charges are a nice thing too because we have Immortal Call in this build, which is like a defensive skill that will proc itself um, due to the, the gem. So we have this attached to cast when damage taken. So this thing will go off by its own when we take damage provide us with a defense boost and that defense boost is significantly increased by having endurance charges which it consumes so you get a you get a defensive bonus just for having the charges and then when your cast when damage taken procs um those endurance charges will then give you a much better immediate defensive boost from mortal call um you also get a little bit more uh reduced elemental damage when you have an endurance charge a little bit more damage pen when you have a power charge it's just a pretty good uh, node, especially when you get get it right before you go into maps, get a nice little uh, boost there. And then finally, uh, Uber Labyrinth. What level you're gonna be when you get to Uber Lab is it's sort of up in the air. It depends on how uh, how much luck you have in finding all six of the trials and maps, or you know how how much you look for help in you know global chat. 
for finding all six trials. Hopefully you can find it around, you know, level 85 at the latest. Um, but I've had, I've had characters that didn't get it done until level 90, just because I was trying to find them myself. Uh, this is what that skill tree looks like. Um, mostly you're picking up some damage here. Uh, we've picked up the second jewel socket for clear mind, which is a, just like a damage boost and a mana regen boost when you aren't reserving any of your mana, which we're not going to be doing um, for the sake of mind over matter, basically. And then for the Uber Lab point, you're going to be taking Divine Guidance, which increases the amount of damage that goes to your mana instead of your health, but it also gives you a really big uh, amount of max mana for free. And then that's further increased by the 10% max mana behind it. Uh, this is a pretty large chunk of mana. As you can see, we go from 2700 to like 3200. So if you look at the mana regen, though, this is one of the bigger aspects. We go from 281 to 350 and that's actually without the region we also get from having totems you can see that uh, path of building is not calculating you know the uh, half a percent mana per totem so this is actually a lot of, of regen too which is relevant because our skills actually cost quite a bit of mana we don't want the mana that we're using to put totems down or cast curses to eat too much into our mana pool so that we are at least always close to full if we take a big hit, we have the mana to spend for Mind Over Matter. Uh, Gear-wise, this build, one of the advantages of this build is that we're not relying on anything like uh, super rare, right? The only uniques we use in this build are Essence Worms, which they can be a little bit spendy at League Start, but they tend to normalize and they don't typically go over like 30 chaos. They might go up to like 35 to 40 really early. But I, I, I would expect to pay somewhere between 30 and 40 for each of these. Um, so not terribly expensive. Uh, we'll pick up a Wise Oak, which is for like damage penetration mostly. Uh, and then the Rain of Splinters Jewel I mentioned, which is always super cheap. Um, the damage, the reduced damage you do goes from 30 to 40. So try to try to get as close to 30 as you can. None of them are going to be expensive because people are definitely not going to be playing a ton of totems in this uh, in this league. So try to you know get a thirty percent if you can, and then a clear mind. This is probably the second most expensive item, um, especially towards a league start. But because this league is going to be so melee focused, I don't think this is going to be as expensive as it was last league. Um, and you don't really have to worry too much about the rules on this one. The uh, if I'm not mistaken. The spell damage is so yeah from forty to sixty, so this is a this is like a completely middle of the line clear mind, which would be totally fine. Uh, the gear that I have in this profile is actually the exact gear that I ended in synthesis minus the circle of anguish rings, which uh, I'd, I'd love to have again, but they are disappearing with synthesis, and we won't be able to get them again. They were. <laughs> they were absurdly powerful. Um, but everything else here is quite realistic for maybe like three to four weeks into the league. Um, if not sooner, depending on how serious you are. This is all like mostly crafted stuff with some trading on the side. Uh, a multi-modded scepter. Obviously not that cheap of a multi-modded scepter. It's too exalted just to do a multi-mod. I think two of these mods are one exalt mods. Um, but like I said, this build was so powerful, accumulating currency league start was really not that big of a deal. Um, and I actually alteration this scepter myself. I also alterationed, uh, this body armor and crafted this myself. Um, for the most part, the items that you see here are pretty good targets for what you're going to need if you wind up playing this build. Um, in particular, on the weapon, you're going to be looking for that physical damage is extra fire. That's going to be the one mod you want before you multi-mod. If you can get something else, like uh, if you've got the patience to get you know, a crit chance roll, um, do so. But that physical damage is extra fire 
is mandatory. Like you absolutely want that on your weapon before you multi mod it. Um, and then we've got spell damage and fire damage to spells. One other thing to be careful when you're crafting a weapon is that you don't want, unlike a lot of builds, you don't want non chaos as chaos because we are utilizing Avatar of Fire. Avatar of Fire means that it converts half of our damage into fire. And because Holy Flame Totem already converts half of its damage from physical to fire, this gives us a 100% conversion from physical to fire. But the other thing that this, this node does is it prevents you from dealing anything but fire damage. So if you craft something like, you know, gain 20% of physical as extra lightning damage, it won't do anything. It'll just, it'll turn it into lightning damage, and then Avatar of Fire will turn that into zero, because you're not allowed to do anything but fire damage. So don't put something like, you know, flat lightning to spells, won't do anything. You don't want non-chaos as chaos. Um, you want generic spell damage, fire damage to spells, or crit modifiers, or cast speed. Uh, your shield. This is one of the more important items, because this is where you get your final plus one maximum number of summoned totems. This will give you your fourth totem. And obviously every totem you add is a huge increase to your total damage. Um, as you can see, uh, I think this is the uber lab level. So each totem is doing 379,000 shaper DPS. Um, adding one is a huge increase, basically. Adding 33% damage. The best thing to do with these, though, you, especially early in the league, is to craft your own. Which means you get a shaper shield that ideally would be like a fossilized spirit shield or something else that has a, an increased spell damage implicit. And then scouring it. You just want to find one that's over item level 70. That is the minimum item level you can have to, so, the, so the shield can roll plus one totems, basically. You can just, you can have anything on it. It can be a rare with garbage on it. Just buy it from the guy for really cheap and scour it. And then you want to use alterations to just spam alterations until you get plus one totems. At the earliest part of the league, it doesn't matter what the hell else this shield has. Just get plus one totems on it with alterations. Slap a regal on it if you want a yellow mod. And then, uh, you know, go about your business and put a crafted mod on it, you know. That's what I did. I wound up slamming this with exalts at the very end of the league because I was bored. But you really just want maximum totems. And then uh, if it doesn't roll life, craft life onto it, basically. Uh, your helmet is a really standard rare. It's life mana resists. Um, the enchant I bought was the uh, increased projectile speed for Holy Totem. That winds up giving you the biggest clear speed increase, but it also just kind of gives you a better quality of life on fights that um, you might not necessarily think, like Uber Elder. There are phases in that fight that involve a lot of adds, um, and both of the enemies in that fight move around a lot. So the more range you can have on your totems, the more um, likely your totems are going to be able to hit those bosses from where they are, and you don't have to resummon them as often. So it's not just uh, really good for clear, it's just kind of good in general. And it wound up being my favorite enchant uh, for Holy Flame Totem. I have all, all the options for that. Uh, body armor. This is a pretty flexible spot, and you can do a bunch of things. Um, lore Weave is actually not a terrible idea, but my recommendation would be to get a Shaper chest piece. Um, I wish I remembered what the item level for this was. I want to say it's like 81. You should definitely Google this. <laughs> Google the item level, but you want a Shaper chest piece um, that is hybrid uh, armor and energy shield. That I think I or I think it's 81. You want a hybrid like this so that it's really easy to to, to color your sockets basically. Um, and what I would recommend doing is alterationing this until it rolls spell crit. Uh, you want that highest tier roll of uh, where it says uh, spells have plus up to plus 1.5 percent crit chance. That's like base crit chance. And it winds up adding a lot of damage to the build. As you can see, we go from 337,000 DPS 
per totem to 379. And our effective crit chance actually goes up by more than 10%. Just because of that, that crit bonus. So because you can get that on top of... This has this one that I crafted during Synth had 120 life, 40 cold res, plus 2 physical damage reduction, and then I crafted the hybrid 8% life and mana. That comes from Syndicate Crafting. It just winds up being the best one, in my opinion, for our build. Um, you can kind of do whatever you want here, whatever makes you comfortable. But this is my recommendation. Uh, gloves. Another shaper item slot. Uh... Ideally, you can get a set of gloves like this that rolls both. These are shaper mods that have uh, slower projectiles and faster casting. The slower projectiles isn't something that you're going to actually be using, but when it rolls that affix, it also rolls uh, increased projectile damage. And that's why you want that mod on there. It's not nearly as important as faster casting, though, because that faster casting also rolls with plus 14 generic cast speed. And you're going to use both of those because what you're going to do is you're going to socket your flammability links in here. And this will give you basically a five link um, faster casting, increased duration, arcane surge, and spell cascade because you're going to actually self cast your curse. Um, and when I show the gameplay at the end, you'll see what that looks like. But you're going to do self casting for two reasons. One, it allows you to run a really high level of arcane surge. Uh, and two, it allows you to apply curses from anywhere on the screen and it's really easy to do it's it casts insanely fast so i just find that it works best to take care of arcane surge which is really important but also to make it really easy to curse everything and still get the damage um on a side note flammability is not quite the highest dps option here uh projectile weakness usually winds up being a small dps increase of around like 4%. See that? 379 to like 393. There's two issues with projectile weakness though. If we take a look at the gem. Uh, the first is that it has a 155 dex requirement for max level. This is a lot worse than it sounds. Um, especially because if you take a look at our tree. We're not getting a lot of dex. Like, even up to level 95 in this gear, I have 111 dex. Because the truth is, we only get one dex point in this whole route. And then we get dex, a tiny amount of dex down here. Like this, there's 30 dex, 40 dex. Ugh, you know, it's, it's hard to get 155 dex. I could have done it in this gear if I, you know, maybe I'd switched one of these rolls like... That has 34. I mean, this this 40 to strength roll could have been dex, I guess. But this amulet was so good that, I mean, what am I going to do? Give up this amulet and try and find a better one that has just dex? It's not easy, basically, to get 155 dex in our build. Um, and the other problem is that this mana, the, the curse has a lower mana cost. And you might think that sounds weird, that that would be a problem. But remember that we're using this to trigger our Arcane Surge. And Arcane Surge triggers when you spend a certain amount of mana with the skill it's linked to, and then it grants you the buff. Well, the lower the cost, the more cast it's going to take to cross the threshold. Alternatively, you'd have to lower the rank of Arcane Surge, which lowers the effect of the buff, to a lower level so that it costs less mana to trigger. And neither one of these things are great. Like, it's not a huge penalty. If we go from 16 to 14, you know, we lose, what, 8,000 DPS? But it's not, it sort of eats into the efficiency of that. And between that and the dex, it's not, like, a great thing. Um, it's something you do to min-max, like, really late. Um, I, I, I still hadn't done it uh, by the time I, well after I'd killed Uber Elder. So... Just something to think about if you're still playing this build like a month in and you're really trying to min-max. This is one place you can get a free like 4% damage. Um, let's see. 
boots not much to say here these are really standard like it's like a really standard defensive slot you can get a good uh stat roll i had strength at the time if you needed dex this would be another place you could get it uh life and mana any of these slots where you can afford to get mana you really want to um just because mana is so important to us since we're splitting 40 percent of our damage into our mana pool if you take a look at so this is like the level 95 version I wound up with like 3,300 mana. And if you take a look, this is like the calculations page. I'm basically protecting 4,970 amount. Like 4,970 of my health is protected by my mana, which is eight points more than I actually have. So I'm barely covering my life with over 3,000 mana. So it, it shows you how important it is to get mana basically wherever you can. Uh, the only things to know about the boost slot are that A, you can craft totem placement speed on it, which I would recommend, just because it makes your clear speed a lot smoother. But also the enchant, which you can get from, from Labyrinth. Uh, there's two enchants that specify you doing something. There's this one, which is 120% increased critical strike chance if you haven't crit recently. And there's another one that's damage penetrates 8% of enemy resistances if you haven't killed recently, I think. And because we can't deal any damage ourselves, it's our totems that do things, these buffs on boots, those two buffs, are always active. Because we're not critting, our totems are. And our totems are killing instead of us. The critical strike chance, I think, wound up being a little bit better for me when I math them out, but either one of those is fine. Because there's kind of a large pool of enchants you might get. Uh, just uh, keep enchanting your good boots until you get one of those two. And then stick with that. It's usually good enough. Uh, for the amulet, this slot is pretty important for damage. So when you're looking for what you want to get on your amulet slot, try to focus this slot in particular basically into pure offense. Um, for, for one reason... It's one of the only slots you can get a large multiplier, like a crit strike multiplier on. So that's going to be one of the, the stats you're going to be looking out for. And then this is also a slot, if it's an elder item, it can roll physical damage as extra fire damage, which is humongously important for us. So for that reason, you're really going to want an elder, an elder amulet. Um, I rolled this onto a citrine just for the strength and the dex but you can do whichever one you want pretty much. And then you can craft projectile speed onto this one if you have the room for it. Uh, for the rings, I'm actually doing essence worms to replace uh, the circles of anguish, which I will miss forever. Um, this ring allows you to slot an aura or allows you to slot anything that would reserve mana and it will not reserve any mana, basically. But if you try to slack at those anywhere else in your gear, they would cost more. So because we don't want to reserve any of our mana, we use these to get access to those buffs. And we would put Herald of Ash in one and Zealotry in the other. Now, up until you get both of these, like if you just have one Essence Worm, you want to prioritize Herald of Ash first. Herald of Ash is about a 20% DPS loss to lose. I think Zealotry is about 15, 16. So for your first Essence Worm, make sure you put Herald of Ash in there first. And then if you get a second one, use that for Zealotry. Um, the only thing to know for this is that if you get a, a Watcher's Eye, I think I put one in here. Yeah, if you get a Watcher's Eye like this, that has damage pen and damage as extra fire damage while affected by anger. This type of Watcher's Eye will make it worth swapping um, swapping out Herald of Ash for anger. But without these affixes, Herald of Ash beats anger pretty cleanly. So if you do wind up having that kind of say luck, then feel free to switch Herald of Ash for Anger, but otherwise, stick with those two auras. Uh, belt is super standard. 
just defenses. Um, I use a Stygian Vice. It allows me to sock at a jewel. These jewels are going to be nerfed a little bit in 3.7. I'm not 100% certain it'll be worth using a Stygian. Um, but it probably will be. You can also make these a little bit better by using Scorched Fossils. You can actually do that on the helm too. That was the other thing I didn't um, mention. If you use Scorched Fossils when you're crafting these, you can roll... Um, I think for helmets, it's minus 9% fire resistance for nearby enemies, which would obviously be a nice free affix to have uh, on your helmet. And you can get 30% fire damage on a belt using Scorched Fossils. So if you want to min-max here, you'd probably want to use Scorched Fossils um, and then get as much defense as you can. Also, increased life recovery is pretty good here, just because we don't have a ton of life regen. And increasing it um, on your belt is pretty useful. Flasks are really pretty much standard, right? Other than Wise Oak, which if you've never used, it basically looks at your resistances and it does two things. It gives you more resistance uh, against the lowest resistance you have. And then it gives you more damage, pen damage penetration against whichever one is highest. And that includes resistance over the cap. This isn't really too much of a problem because like we only do fire damage and this firewalker node that gives us fire damage also gives us fire resistance. So it's gonna be likely that you're gonna have, um, that fire resistance is gonna be a little bit higher than the rest of them, which will basically guarantee that you always get fire penetration the uh reduced damage is not really i mean it's okay but it's not something i'd worry about too much if you really want to min max the best thing to do is to basically divine your gear and look for gear to try and make all of your resistances exactly the same because then both of these affixes will trigger for all three resists uh, it's really an enormous pain to do this. I don't know if you've ever tried, but it sucks. So I would just recommend making sure your fire resist is higher than everything else and then uh, and then not worrying about the rest, basically. Uh, I've got a silver flask for Onslaught. I add curse removal on this one. Um, it's not super important. I had a uh, shock resist on my diamond flask. This diamond flask is probably the most important flask on here, other than the wise oak, because this gives you an enormous amount of effective crit chance. Uh, long story short is basically when a diamond flask is active, it rolls your it rolls your chance to crit twice, and then it takes whichever one's higher. So you get a lot of effective crit whenever this flask this flask is active. I think I had shock immunity on this one because there was an enormous amount of shock in synthesis. And then a Quicksilver Flask, which I just have for running around. And it gives me the freeze immunity, which is pretty pretty vital. You can have this to be whatever you want. But having freeze immunity is pretty important. A range of Splinters I went over. This is pretty much uh, just for clear. It gives you two extra spouts of fire. And it doesn't really cost us a ton of damage. Like... We lose 20,000 DPS or so, but the amount of clear speed you gain out of this is totally worth it. And then clear mine, which is just more mana regen and more damage, um, so long as we don't have anything reserved, which thanks to the rings, we don't. As far as the other two jewel slots, the kind of rare jewels you're looking for are probably closer to this one that I had. You're, you're mainly looking for crit multi, life, and projectile speed. Those are the three stats you would have on every jewel uh, if you could. Obviously, fire damage is okay. Cast speed is okay. Any kind of defensive stats are okay. In in terms of like priority, try to get 7% life and then multiplier. It can be crit multiplier with fire skills, crit multiplier with just spells. Um, I think there's crit multi with elemental skills, which applies to our fire totem. 
but um, any one of those is fine. If you can get two crit multipliers, great. Um, the projectile speed I'd rate third, but it's still useful. Like I said, it's the only way um, to make your Holy Flame Totem shoot farther. Because we're not like, uh, we're not running, this doesn't have an area tag. So increased AoE doesn't do anything. It just has a projectile tag. The only way you can make your totem shoot farther is projectile speed. We get a little bit of projectile speed down here in Lethal Assault. One of the other reasons that I come down here. Um, but there's really, if you take a look in Path of Building, you can search. There's just no, <laughs> there's almost none in the tree. And what is there is on the opposite side of where we start. So this is like the only projectile speed you can get. The rest of it we have to get through things like our helm enchant, right? 30% increased projectile speed. We get some on the amulet, we can craft it. And then we can get some on the jewels, which I highly recommend you do. Um, yeah, and that's about it for the gear. Um, what else is there to talk about? Oh, the skill links are pretty important, eh? So, let's go into the game for this. It's a little bit easier to see. Alt-tab back here. So as far as gem links go, you're going to want your Holy Flame Totem in your chest. Because you need a six link for this. Uh, Holy Flame Totem, obviously the most important. Getting level 21 is a pretty big increase. And the best way to, to go about doing this is basically to corrupt it yourself so you don't have to pay for it and what you want to do then is at this st at the very start of the game you get holy flame totem at like level four i think you get it as soon as you finish the mud flats what you want to do is buy the first one you're going to use and socket it and then buy a couple of wands that have three blue sockets um i currently have divine iron here because i was leveling some stuff to sell but socket um six copies of holy flame totem actually you're gonna want sorry you're gonna want red sockets so you probably want to use something like axes like grab two swords or axes that have three red sockets and put six copies of holy flame totem in there too and uh even though they'll be on your weapon swamp like this and this is what you're actually gonna be fighting with they'll still get experience and they'll still level up and so when these hit level 20 what you can do uh, is grab a gem cutter's prism, right? And sell the gem, whatever. How are you, you basically sell it to a vendor, a GCP, along with the level 20 gem, and she'll give you back a level one gem of the same one with 20 quality. And then you can re-level them at 20 quality the same way. Uh, and then once you're at 20, you can go ahead and corrupt the six that you leveled in your offhands like this and hopefully get one that hits level 21. You know, if you're lucky, you'll get more than one that hits level 21 and you can sell the others for a bunch of money. But you just want one for yourself, basically, because you get a big damage increase every rank. Uh, so that last rank winds up being a lot of free damage you don't want to miss out on, right? Uh... The second gem, Elemental Focus, this is just the biggest damage increase we have access to. The downside being you can't inflict elemental ailments. Not super relevant. We don't really care about uh, ignites for this skill. We just want it to shoot damage. So this is a no-brainer. Uh, Infused Channeling is the third link. And a lot of people get confused by this because the first line says totems can't gain infusion. So they think, well... Why would I use it? Um, the thing is, the infusion doesn't grant the damage bonus, or the main damage bonus for this skill. Uh, infusion only grants the 10% more damage of the types matching supported skill gem, and it also grants the like less damage taken. But that's all infusion does. The part where it says supported skills deal 39% more damage, that's just part of the gem, period. So... As long as you're using a channeling skill, which Holy Flame Totem is, you'll get 39% more damage out of this. And it's actually only worse 
than uh, than um, elemental focus. So this should be the second gem use slot. Control destruction is the third one. Um, this one actually has a slightly larger multiplier, but the problem is that it reduces your crit chance. Some people get confused by this and think that it like eliminates your crit chance, but it actually just lowers it by a hundred. Um, we obviously get a lot of additional crit chance in the tree, right? All these nodes that increase our crit chance. This just removes 100% of it. It still winds up being a huge increase and you should have it. Uh, fourth would be fire penetration. This allows flame totem to pierce the resistance of enemies and that resistance can go negative. So this is, this winds up just basically being a really nice against targets that have anything above zero. Um, particularly hard bosses like Shaper and Elder. Um, but it works against everything, so you should definitely have it. And then the last link. The last link, I have Combustion right now. And in the guide on the forums, I'll tell you to use... I'll tell you to use Added Fire. The reason for that is because until you have weapons, or until you have this physical damage extra fire on your weapon and on your amulet... Added fire here actually does more DPS. The value of this physical damage is extra fire damage goes down a little bit as you get more of it. So the added fire damage gem uh, has more value on the low on the, on the earlier game than it does before you hit this sort of end game level of gear. So at the start, this last one should be added fire damage actually, but then. Once you have these two affixes, go ahead and swap it in for a combustion. We can't ignite things, so the additional 19% penetration, we can't actually trigger that, because elemental focus is going to block us from igniting things. But um, the more fire damage does apply, and the 10% increased fire damage. That's enough to be added fire damage. As long as you have more of uh you know the added fire damage here and here uh i think i went over the glove links here i have a lightning warp setup this is pretty like optional i just have it because you have space for the links this this four link can pretty much be whatever you want um this particular setup gives you like a basically an instant lightning warp which is useful in some maps. It's basically a convenience thing because Lightning Warp can go pretty much the whole screen, like in your line of sight, whereas Flame Warp won't quite go that far. So there's some gaps like... I don't know. Here in the Ravaged Square, there's one where you have to like cross a river and one of the bridges is broken, but Lightning Warp can like just barely cross that whereas flame dash can stuff like that and what you do is you do a lightning warp and you attach it to swift affliction and less duration and less duration reduces the time uh between when you cast it and when you actually teleport and then faster casting just to make it even faster uh here this is not really super relevant for 3.7 because I was using Circle of Anguish Rings. So I actually had to reserve some mana for uh, Herald of Ash, which we won't be doing in 3.7. And then this is the cast when damage taken. So, let's see. Da -da -da. Oh yeah, so the Pantheon, um, Soul of the Brine King is pretty good just to not get stun locked. This will prevent you from getting stunned more than once every two seconds. Uh, the other effects aren't amazing, but they're kind of useful for like uh, Uber Elder. 50% reduced effect of chill isn't bad. The main one you just want is the, the first one from Brian King. That'll prevent you from getting completely stun locked, but you still will get stunned if you get mobbed. Um, I find that this is just like enough to stop me from getting killed very often. And then for the miner, I usually take Shikari. I don't feel like the miners are too important, and I never felt like I needed, um, what is it, Rizalatha? 
this one that like refills your life flasks. I never really used life flasks so much that I felt this was amazing. This one, the main effect of it's not amazing. Reduced chaos damage taken and reduced damage from like caustic ground. But if you upgrade this, the immune to poison I think is actually kind of nice. Because if you ever wind up running Uber Lab or something, those poison darts can't poison you. <laughs> so it's like, it's just a convenience thing. Um, really, you can just use whatever you want for the miners. But this Soul of the Brian King is the wreck, is the the major I would use. If you decide to use this Helm slot, um, or use one of your slots for cast when damage taken, and use um, Kalm's Roots here for some reason, then obviously you can move Soul to Brine King. And I would move it over to Lunaris if you're going to run Kalm's Roots, because the, the boots would give you immunity to stun to cover this. And this would allow you to upgrade to um, avoid projectiles that have chained. This, like, chain is one of the few map mods that can be kind of annoying for totems, because they can either shoot you and it will chain to your totem, or they can, like, shoot you and then have it hit your totem, and then the, the projectile chains from your totem to you. So sometimes you can get hit like multiple times compared to when you just normally get hit once, just because you're like basically putting things for them to bounce projectiles off of into you. So Lunaris would actually prevent those from hitting you. They'd pass right through you. So yeah, I feel like that covers pretty much everything. I guess what we can do here, I did make a map. I'll show what it looks like in terms of average clear speed and stuff. It's a really simple build to play, which is basically all my builds. I'm not like the most active. I don't like playing really complicated builds. I like builds that are just strong and they allow me to focus on like avoiding stuff and kind of like looking at the screen and not worrying about cooldowns and shit. Um, you know, one thing I should do this, I have these circle of anguish rings. These are way more powerful than the rings we would have in 3.7. So I'm just going to take them off. And I'm just not going to use rings. So this is going to, I mean, obviously I'd be doing more with ring slots in, in 3.7, but everything else here is 3.7 acquirable. I'm not using any synthesis gear. So what we'll do is we'll run like a, we'll run a tier 15. This is a tier 15 waste pool. Not like super dangerous affixes. But it'll just give you an idea of like what the clear speed looks like. Um, when you first enter an area, usually you want to summon your totems really quick. Activating your totems will trigger conviction of power. And so you can summon some, some charges when you start out. But pretty much you just want to activate your flasks. Keep your totems out in front of you. And, uh, you know, fucking kill shit. Stuff, the amount of damage that this build does is way more than you need for average clearing. I'm not even, I'm like hardly paying attention. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> so. Like, we're not the tankiest thing in the world, but that was a lot of damage. Like, that would have killed a lot of casters. <laughs> like, running into 10 snakes like that in a tier 15. I think we've got, like, 24% uh, more damage, too. But thanks to Mind Over Matter and a decent amount of pool, we can take all this shit. We've also got Vol Righteous Fire, which will give you a nice cooldown to hit. Pop it, get some extra damage. He's just gonna get popped. <laughs> you don't even really have to pay attention. Um, so yeah, this... This is kind of what all the maps look like. You don't really have to worry about the affixes on a map for this build. Um, I would say... So Elemental Reflect is doable, but it's a little bit annoying because your totems will kill themselves, but it won't reflect onto you, right? They'll just kill themselves. 
So if you're willing to sort of play slow and kind of constantly resummon your totems, you can clear your way through in a reflect map. The one that you probably can't run would be players cannot regenerate mana. It's like life and mana. You're pretty reliant on your mana regeneration in particular. So that I would re-roll that one for sure. Um, otherwise, pretty much everything's doable. Like temporal chains kind of sucks, but as long as you have curse removal on your flask and you're killing things consistently, you know, you can just flask your way through it. I never really had too many issues with maps in general. You can kind of just facial your way <laughs> all the way up to Uber Elder, pretty much. Um, none of none of the guardians even killed me, I think. Neither shapers or elders. Unfortunately, I don't like the characters have been moved to standard, and I don't have um, tier sixteen maps for the guide right now. But I do have videos in the build guide uh, on the forums if you want to look at what this build was doing against Shaper or Uber Elder or any of the Guardians. I have all those in the guide. I'll link that in the description too. I can't think of too much more to add to this guide right now as much as I've rambled. But yeah, I am going to be playing this as a league start for sure in Legion. And it comes highly recommended. It doesn't require a lot of maintenance. It doesn't require a lot of gear to get started. There are no actually mandatory uniques. Um, it really just doesn't require a lot of investment to get going. It's very safe just because you kind of, you know, you can lead with your totems and they'll be the one to, to aggro enemies. Um, yeah. All told, this gear, like if we look at the level 95 version, the the gear that I ended synthesis with, um, if we swap these out for essence worms, which would be much weaker than my circles of anguish, we're still um, over half a million shaper DPS per totem. And the only buffs we have up uh, are our flasks um, and our power charges because we, we generate power charges for free just for summoning totems. Um, if you have Vol Righteous Fire Up, I think we get like, you know, 600 and almost 680,000 per totem. All told, you know, you're easily clearing 2 million Shaper DPS. More than 2.5 with Vol Righteous Fire. That's way, way more than you need for anything in this game. Like, Uber Elder is comfortable on this amount of damage. Um, but, you know, like, like I showed here in Waste Pool, the clear speed for mapping is really not that bad. You know, you're not, like, you're not going to impress any, any, like, winter orb tricksters or anything. But, you know, you're not, you're not hurting. In terms of like just comparing this to other totem builds, I, I personally put this at the very top. Uh, mainly just because of how fast uh, Holy Flame Totem shoots his projectiles. If you notice there, there's a very small window of time between you place a totem and when it starts shooting. So the amount of time it takes for it to do something when it does start shooting is kind of important. Um, Purifying Flame Totem, for example, if you try to attach that to Spell Totem, it has a much slower cast animation, and there's more travel time for the projectile, and then it has to detonate, and then there's a shockwave after the detonation. All that is a lot of time that it takes between just you running around dropping totems. The Holy Flame Totem shoots its projectiles very quickly, and once they're fired, they're insanely fast. This is also helped by our projectile speed. Um, and so, when you have the amount of projectile speed that I do in this gear, um, you cover about mid-screen to the edge of the screen, right? It's a very large cone, and you saw the extra gouts of fire, I think, uh, from, from Reign of Splinters, right? The, uh, the, the unique jewel here. 
and it's covering a really wide cone very quickly. So it's like as close to immediate damage you can get outside of arc. And with arc's effective range so much lower, and it having a da like a target cap, whereas the the fire projectiles from Holy Flames with them have no cap, they will pierce every target in their path. This just feels like the most immediate kind of damage you can get out of a totem. And the Hierophant is the one who uh, places these totems down the fastest. So, put together, this is, this is, in my opinion, about as fast in terms of clear as a totem, speed, uh, totem build is going to get. But you don't have to sacrifice your single target DPS completely to get it. You know, 2 million Shaper DPS um, will actually defeat every piece of content in Path of Exile really comfortably. So this is going to be my league start for 3.7. And uh, if you're not sure what to do, I highly uh, recommend trying it. New player or not, you know, this is a really easy build to get into. Um, I will be streaming this build starting tomorrow, actually. Um, I'll put a link to my Twitch in the description as well when I upload this. If you aren't sold, but you want to see what it looks like, I will definitely be playing the hell out of Legion this weekend. Uh, and whether you do or don't wind up using this for your league starter, uh, good luck in Legion. Have fun. Thanks for watching.